All right, so next we want to look at how do you actually find the radius and the interval of convergence, right? So we defined these in the last video. Um, we saw that these are things that are guaranteed to exist for any power series. I mean, at least we stated the theorem. We didn't prove it, but we stated the theorem. So how do we actually track them down? Well, we need one more theorem that helps us out. And the main issue that we still have is the following. Somebody hands you a power series, like an x minus c to the n, right? and you want to tackle the, this question of convergence for this thing. And the fact that you have powers here, right? you think about the various convergence tests that we've used, when you're dealing with powers, both the ratio and the root test are going to come in handy, right? Because if you take the nth root of that power, the power goes away. Ratio, we know that when you take the ratio test, powers tend to cancel out. Um, ratio test tends to be the best tool for the job. Um, but the ratio test only applies to series where the, the terms in the series are positive, right? Sequences of positive terms. Um, and here, we don't have that, okay? So, and especially because, you know, x minus c, you know, this could be either positive or negative, depending on the value of x. These could be negative. Uh, but it turns out that you can take the absolute value of the terms in your, in your series, and that doesn't affect the radius of convergence. So these have the same radius of convergence, right? Um, now, we need to be careful that doesn't imply that they have the same interval of convergence, right? Um, if this actually converges absolutely, you know, for, for all values of x that you're looking at, then yeah, they should, everything should be exactly the same, right? Um, but it might be that at the ends of your interval of convergence, you might have conditional convergence at an endpoint. So this is one of the things you have to watch out for, is that sometimes when you apply the ratio test, you look for convergence, you discover that you get your interval, you get your radius, the ratio test is essentially going to give you the radius, right? Uh, let me, let me point out, why does, why does the ratio test give you the radius? Well, if you think about doing the ratio test, you'd be looking at a n plus 1, right? x minus c to the n plus 1. And you're taking the absolute value. Your absolute value of a quotient is quotient of the absolute values. So this is, this is the same thing, right? And again, the whole point of the ratio test is that you get this cancellation. So what you get is this ratio, a n plus 1 over a n. And then you're just left with the absolute value of x minus c. So typically what's going to happen is you're going to let n go to infinity. All right? This is going to approach some ratio, right? So this is going to come to some limit. So you can get a limit times x minus c, right? And we know that in the ratio test, right, ratio test gives you convergence if the limit for the whole thing comes out to be less than 1, right? So that means that you, you're going to need x minus c to be less than 1 over this, this limit, right? Okay. So um, this 1 over L, well, obviously this is going to be, right, if this is finite, right? So if L, and by the way, if L is equal to 0, then this is satisfied for all values of x, right? That's going to be the case where you have infinite radius of convergence. Um, but if L is some finite non-zero limit, well, then this 1 over L, that's going to give you the radius of convergence, right? Um, and that tells you that, well, and again, it's strict inequality for the, ra for the ratio test, right? So this inequality is saying that absolute value of x minus c is less than r. That is exactly the same thing as saying that, you know, c minus r is less than x is less than c plus r. There's your interval, okay? 
But the, ra the ratio test isn't going to tell you about what happens at the endpoints. You got to check that separately, right? And often what happens is that at one of the endpoints, you've got an alternating series. So the alternating series test is going to apply, right? Um, sometimes you actually get absolute convergence at both ends, but sometimes you only get one end or the other. Uh, let's look at some examples to see if we can uh, observe some of this behavior, okay? Look at the first one. X to the n over n factorial. So if we, if we take this approach, right, we're going to get um, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial times n factorial over x to the n, okay? So if you simplify, this is just absolute value of x over n plus 1, right? And the whole point is now that although x is a variable, right, for any fixed value of x, for any single one value, right, if we fix the value for x and we say, well, what happens for any given value of x as n goes to infinity? Well, even for a really big value of x, as long as it's one particular value, if n is going to infinity, this is going to go to 0, right, as n goes to infinity. Independent of x always goes to 0. 0 is always less than 1, right? So this is going to be a case where the radius of convergence is infinite and the interval is just minus infinity to infinity, right? Okay, so far so good. Let's look at the next one. So if we go to the next one, right? Now the absolute value is going to kill that sine factor, so I'm not even going to bother writing it. x to the n plus 1, n plus 1 times n over x to the n, okay? So this is going to be n over n plus 1 times the absolute value of x, okay? And where is that going to go in the limit? That's just going to go to the absolute value of x, right, as, uh, as n goes to infinity. And so what do we need? We need absolute value of x to be less than 1. Okay, all right, so r is equal to 1 for this one, right? The interval, now, the interval is from minus 1 to 1. But what about the endpoints? Um, can we include the endpoints? So what you have to do for the endpoints, right? Let's just kind of do this over here. So here's part b, and we'll look at the endpoints. If x is equal to 1, okay, that's one end of the interval. Well, if x is equal to 1, I'm going to get the sum, and going from 1 to infinity, minus 1 to the n plus 1 times 1 over n. That's alternating harmonic series, right? This, this converges. What about at the other end point? At the other end point, we're going to get minus 1 to the n plus 1 times minus 1 to the n over n. Well, so that's minus 1 to the 2n plus 1, odd number of minus signs, right? This is just going to be minus 1 over n. And aside from the minus sign there, that's the harmonic series. We know that the harmonic series diverges, right? So this diverges. And since it diverges, the interval here is going to be, well, we have to exclude minus 1, but we can include 1, okay? Um, now, this last one, this last one's actually geometric. Maybe it doesn't look like it, but it's geometric. I can write that as 2 times x minus 3 all to the nth power, okay? So that means that my, you know, my r, if I was doing this as a geometric series, is like 2 times x minus 3. 
And yes, you can do this by the ratio test. The ratio test will get you to the same place, right? It'll get you to the absolute value of r. Absolute value of r will be 2 times absolute value of x minus 3. We need that to be less than 1, OK? So x minus 3 has to be less than 1 half, OK? So that tells me that the radius of convergence is 1 half. And actually, the interval in this case, the interval is going to be from 2.5, so uh, 5 over 2, to 3.5, 7 over 2. And it's an open interval. Why? Because we know, we already know, that for a geometric series, we get divergence at plus or minus 1. We already know that, right? Um, but if you want, you can check the endpoints. You can plug in. If you plug in 5 over 2 or 7 over 2, this is going to be either plus or minus 1 half. So either this is just 1 or it's minus 1 to the n. But either way, that's a series that diverges. So you get the open interval.